previous lecture we uh, uh, almost finished uh, our treatment for large language models. Uh, the, the last thing that we discussed was that uh, large language models are transformer based and transformers uh, computationally are extensive because uh, they are on the order of n squared and there are many models uh, trying to reduce the computational cost of transformers and it's a pretty exciting line of research uh, even now that people try to come up with other other models that performs as good as transformers but is not as expensive so we, we among all of them we selected one which was performer because it's based on a pretty neat idea and we wanted to discuss how performer get around the uh, complexity problem. So complexity is n squared when n is the length of uh, the uh, basically uh, your text and uh, so it limit us with the text that we can process, we can make attention, self-attention. So what's the idea of performer? So the idea of performer is uh, based on uh, random projections and uh, producing or approximating a kernel using random features. So if you recall the uh, general form of uh, basically attention was that we had like V softmax of uh, Q transpose K the square root of P, right? When this Q, when actually X was uh, just X1 to Xn was D by N, and then we had a transformation W which take x and produce q, and q is going to be uh, p by n. So this is d by n, then w transpose would be p by d, so w is d by p, right? This is d by p by d. And the same thing for k, there is a transformation which take x to k which is p by n and v is another transformation which take x to v and this is uh, m by n okay <coughs> so uh, q is uh, p by n so when we have q transpose it's going to be n by p and this is p by n and then we take softmax, it's going to be a still n by n times uh, m by n, right? So it's going to be of the order of n squared. Uh, it seems that, you know, we have three matrices to multiply. It's V, it's Q, transpose, and it is K. And we multiply these two, this is which this n by p and this is p by n. We multiply these two and it's going to be n by n. So the complexity comes from basically this multiplication. This is m by n. If somehow magically I can get rid of this soft max because there's a soft max here. If I can get rid of this soft max, I can change the order of this multiplication. I can multiply V by Q, which is M by N, N by P, it's going to be M by P. So it, it does not depend on N anymore, right? And then I'm going to have P by N, which is linear on N. So instead of multiplying this Q to K, if I multiply V to Q and then to K, then I have less complexity. But this softmax is a bottleneck here, you know. I can't, I can't do that because of this soft max. So the idea here actually, the, the main observation here is that, is there any way to get rid of this soft max? 
and represent soft max Q transpose K over square root of P as a matrix multiplication. Sort of Q, tra Q prime transpose times K prime be equal to soft max of Q transpose K over a square root of P. If I can manage to do this, then life would be easy. So I, I reorder this multiplication and I get around the complexity. So that's the main idea. And it's going to use this, yes. Okay, I don't understand why it's better to do in this order versus that order. So the matrix is not n by n anymore. But like, it's p by Yeah, it's p by n. So what's the difference? Like, in, in practice, usually n is like, you know, like the root sequence or something. Yeah, that p is, is p is dimensionality, it's much smaller, right? And uh, n is large, is the length of sequence, and you want to uh, process a long sequence. You know, you want to have attention to all basically words in the sequence. You know, I want, ideally, I want to be able to feed my model with entire novel, you know, from the beginning to the end. I can't do this with transformer, you know, because it depends on the length of sequence and uh, it's, it's, it's squared and the last length of sequence now. Okay, it it's uses an idea of uh, a random approximation of a kernel. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting idea and the, the proof for that is beyond the scope of this course, but if you have, for example, a Gaussian kernel, you know, you want to approximate the Gaussian kernel and Gaussian kernel is e to the power of, uh, you know, Gaussian kernel k Gaussian of x and y is what? Is e to the power of negative x minus y squared with some normalization fact, right? So any kernel is dot product, right? So it's going to be some dot product of this form. So this theorem basically led us to define phi based on some random feature. So that phi transpose x phi y is equal or approximately equal to this kernel. So for example, not for example actually, exactly, if you define phi x to be uh, one over some square root of r of sine omega 1 transpose x uh, sine omega 2 transpose x up to sine omega r transpose x and then cosine omega 1 transpose x up to cosine omega r transpose x. If you define phi to have this form, then, and similarly for y, you know, you can define it for y as well. Then phi transpose x, phi y, is approximation of the Gaussian kernel between x and y. So it, it seems uh, counterintuitive because these are just some random features and how come these random features turn out to be, you know, measure of, that product of them would be measure of similarity between them. So uh, just intuitively, uh, you can think that, uh, you know, if this is your vector x, then these omegas are random vectors drawn from some distribution. So this is, say for example, omega one, and omega one transpose x is a measure of similarity between omega one and x. You know, this omega one transpose x is similarity between omega one and x. And then you have many of these omegas, r of them, you know. This is omega two, and this is omega three, and this is omega r. So, 
omega transpose x with some random omegas locally express similarity of x with some vectors around this in this space. So these are meaningful features, in fact, you know, omegas are random, but it's meaningful features because it's, it, it tells you something about the geometry of this space. But you can prove that this is an, a good approximation of the Gaussian. In general form, you know, this is just for Gaussian. In general form, we can define phi as hx when h is just uh, some deterministic function for different kernels, h is going to be different. In the case of Gaussian, it's 1. For, for other kernels, it's going to be a different function. Divide by r, and then uh, you're going to have f1, omega 1 transpose x. In, in, for Gaussian, this f1 is sine. And up to fr, omega r transpose x. And then f2 and f3 up to fl, you know, depends on the type of the kernel that you want to approximate. Um, that's basically the general form. For different kernels, you have different phi's that you can define as random features. <clears throat> okay, so uh, have this in mind that you can approximate a kernel using random features. Now let's get back to softmax. And the idea is to treat softmax as a kernel. If we treat softmax as a kernel, then I can write it as some sort of phi transpose phi, uh, phi and then I can replace this softmax as a product of two matrices and I can get rid of this softmax. That's the idea. So the goal would be to find a set of random features such that it approximates softmax. You know, this is a set of features that approximate a Gaussian. I need a set of features which approximate softmax. Um, what was softmax? You know, if, uh, say for example, if S is a matrix, and uh, basically uh, if I want to compute softmax, it's going to be e to the power of Sj sum over j e uh, to the power of Sg. So this is soft max of, uh, well, let me write it, a soft max of um, Si, right? Okay. So one uh, operation that I need is e to the power, of, you know, exponent. So if I want to approximate soft max, I need to have this e to the power of. And then I need to normalize it. Okay, suppose that I did compute exponent. How can I normalize it? Normalization, if, if, I, if, I, if I can handle this part, the normalization is not hard, right? Suppose that uh, A, for example, is exponential of S. So somehow I, I managed to make e to the power of s using some random features. So I have it, and it's called a. And I want to normalize it. Normalization is not hard, you know, because this a is just a matrix, and I have to make the rows of this matrix equal to one. So I have to find the summation of each row and divide, divide it by that summation. So it's, I can multiply this by like one, 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 and this is going to be a vector of summation of all of these rows, right? Um, so let's call this, this is A, right? So let's call this vector, uh, vector D. This is D. Then I can uh, multiply, I can find diag of 
D, which is a matrix of this form. But each of these elements is summation of one of the rows of A, right? Uh, let's call this uh, capital D. Then A, D inverse would be this normalization, right? Because this is a diagonal matrix and D inverse would be one over each of these elements, right? So it's, it's easy to uh, normalize this. Somehow I have to find, you know, some random features which make e to the power of s for me. We know Gaussian kernel, right? We know features of Gaussian kernel and it's e to the power of minus x minus y, x minus y. What I need is e to the power of x times y, you know, in a stuff x minus y. But, um, you know, if I look at this kernel that I know, I know how to do this with random features. If I just expand it, it's going to be x minus y is transpose times x minus y, which is uh, e to the power of minus x transpose x times e to the power of minus y transpose y times e to the power of 2 negative uh, or positive 2 x transpose y. I need e to the power of x transpose y for my softmax. So let's assume there's a 2 here. Then I can get rid of these two. This is exactly what I need, e to the power of e to transpose y. So um, I know how to do this in a random form. So if this is kernel of Gaussian, then I can write that e to the power of x transpose y is kernel of Gaussian, which I know how to compute in a random form, times e to the power of x transpose x over 2 times e to the power of y transpose y over 2. Okay? And that's what I need. This I know how to compute uh, with this set of random features. You remember the general form is H divided by R, but in the case of Gaussian, H was 1. So, uh, you know, this is some phi transpose X times phi transpose Y, and these are for Gaussian. And now I learned that if I need this, I have to multiply this by these two as well. Just compare it with the general form. What, what do you think the general form of this is going to be? What is H, in fact? You know, if this is a kernel, the whole thing would be phi transpose phi. This part is phi transpose phi of Gaussian multiplied by these two functions. Right? So this is the H. Right? This is the H. Basically, I can say that the for uh, e to the power of x transpose y, if you want to approximate it uh, using phi transpose phi, uh, let me write it phi of um, softmax. Then this phi of soft max for x is going to be, this is my h. Uh, it's going to be uh, e to the power of x transpose x over 2. And the rest is going to be exactly, you know, the random features that I had for Gaussian, which is just sine omega 1 transpose x up to the end, you know, and then cosine. So if I compute this phi transpose phi, then it's going to be 
uh, e to the power of x transpose y, approximation of that. And if I have e to the power of x transpose y, I, can, I know how to normalize it, right? So I, I managed to write e to the power of x transpose y as dot product of some random features, okay? How many features do we have here? We have r, r is my choice. The, the more, the, the, lar the uh, greater the r is, the better approximation. You know, you can approximate it with 10 features or with 100 features. You introduce more features, more random features, it's gonna be a better approximation. So it's, it's r times two, because it's two type of functions, sine and cosine, so it's two r, right? So it's two r, and r is my choice. Let's call it r prime. So <coughs> in fact, instead of q transpose k, the soft max, eventually I can write some q prime, which is instead of being p by n, it is like r prime by n, and the transpose is going to be uh, n by r prime, and then I have some k prime, which is r prime by n, and then I have v, right? Now instead of this multiplication, I do this multiplication first, and then this one. And I compute the kernel with random features, it's quite fast. You know, I can do it quite fast without computation. So this makes performer much faster and more efficient. Okay, any question? Yes. No, it's not going to be better because eventually you're going to approximate the kernel, right? It's approximation of the kernel. Y you know how to find the exact kernel, you know? That's the exact kernel is your limit, you know? You can't be better than that, right? And there's another limitation here that, you know, we said that Q transpose K is not really a kernel because it's not symmetric, right? Unless you assume that WK and WQ are the same, then it becomes symmetric and it's a real kernel. So there is this implicit assumption here, right? That these two Ws are the same. Uh, and it is a kernel and can be approximated this way. So it's not going to be better. Yes? The omega is just a random vector, just random, you know, just, uh, you know, selected from like a uniform distribution, for example, randomly. Yes? Why different omegas? Because uh, this intuition here, right? If this is only one omega, you know, if you find similarity of this random vector with your x, but I want with different features, you know, I want to capture the geometry of x locally. So I need many omega around x to capture this, the, 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 the geometry here. Many of them. The more the better. Okay. Good. So uh, <clears throat> now we are going to uh, change the gear and start a new topic. And this topic is uh, variational autoencoder. We'll talk about variational autoencoder, which is based on variational inference. And we are going to need this variational inference when we talk about um, stable diffusion models, okay? Uh, so variational autoencoder. Uh, 
Okay, so first what is autoencoder? I think you have seen autoencoder in many cases, but autoencoder is type of neural network, which consists of two parts, uh, a decoder and encoder. So this, this part is encoder, and this part is decoder. And you take X, it takes X, and it produces X. So it takes X, produces X through a bottleneck. Okay. So and let's call this representation Z. Uh, if you have a simple autoencoder, you know, one layer for autoencoder and one layer for decoder here, and if there is no linear nonlinearity, you know. There's no activation function, then it's just a matrix multiplication between X and U. So see, this is matrix U and this is U transpose, for example. And if X is d-dimensional, then you're going to have U transpose X to produce Z, say in p-dimensional space. And then Z will be multiplied by some U to go to X hat again in the dimensional space. If you have such a structure, uh, it's going to be PCA. You know, you remember PCA, right? In, in, in PCA or in singular value decomposition, actually you project your data to lower dimensional space with some uh, transformation matrix U, which is eigenvectors of your sample covariance matrix. And then you can project it back with the inverse of u, and since u is orthonormal, the inverse would be the transpose of this matrix. So basically, you can um, compute u and u transpose by this optimization, you know, subject to the constraint that u transpose u is identity. So if it's orthonormal, this is going to be PCA if x is centered. And if X is not centered, it's going to be singular value decomposition, right? Uh, so this is pretty similar to this case because the objective function here for uh, autoencoder is that I want X to be similar to X hat. You know, I want to go through this bottleneck and regenerate the, the input. So this is basically the same objective function as this one because we do have these two uh, matrices if there is no nonlinearity. Except that we don't have this constraint. So the solution will not be identical to PCA or singular value decomposition, but it's going to expand the same space as uh, basis that we can find here. Okay, So this is a simple autoencoder. Uh, when there's no nonlinearity and this is identical or not identical, it, it spans the same space as PCA. So you can make it deep autoencoder by adding many layers. So the encoder is not just a matrix multiplication. There are many layers here, and there are many layers here, and there are nonlinearity between them. Then it's going to be a deep autoencoder. Okay? And just to mention that. It's not the case that all autoencoders uh, goes through a bottleneck in this form that Z has less dimension than X. There are some types of autoencoder which is called uh, overcomplete autoencoder, and Z has higher dimension than X. Okay, it's called overcomplete autoencoder. In the simple case that we have no nonlinearity. If I have such a structure, uh, X needs to reproduce itself through this structure. Think what's going to happen, you know, if there's D dimension here and there's P, but this P is larger than D. Um, you know, there's a trivial solution here. You know, you can basically copy X. You, you can afford to copy X exactly here and then copy back here. So there's a trivial solution here, which is not going to be useful, but in, in practice, 
people use it for denoising, you know, they add some noise to X. So if you just copy X here and copy it here, that, that's not going to be useful. When you minimize X minus X hat, it's not going to be useful. So you make your input noisy, you pass it through this or complete autoencoder, and then you try to reconstruct the clean X. Uh, so it doesn't have trivial solution. It can be used for um, denoising, you know, just to mention that that's not the case all the time that autoencoders have this bottleneck structure. Okay, if you have many layers, that's going to be uh, a deep autoencoder. So the difference between variational autoencoder and a usual deterministic autoencoder, because variational autoencoder is not deterministic, it's stochastic, is that this Z comes from a certain distribution. So you pass X to the model, you want to reconstruct X, uh, subject to the constraint that Z is Gaussian, for example. Okay, if Z is Gaussian, then you can use this decoder as a generative model. Because this is Gaussian, I can sample from this Gaussian, pass it through this decoder, and it's going to generate, you know, X for me. Say, for example, I trained this on CIFAR data, for example, which is different objects, right? Uh, horse and, you know, cat and dog and, and different things. I, I train it on this data set. After training, I can take this decoder out. I know that the Z should be Gaussian. I, I, I sample from a Gaussian, pass it through the decoder. The output should be similar to the objects that I've observed in um, basically a C4 data set. It's going to be horse cat or, or whatever. Or if I just train it on horse, you know, I can just always by sampling from a Gaussian. So uh, you have a transformer from a Gaussian to a horse, for example, right? So it can be used as a generative model eventually. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think the concept of autoencoder in a deterministic form is quite easy, but let's see how variational autoencoder can be uh, uh, built. It's based on variational inference. And how many of you have seen variational inference before? OK. So variational inference is a technique in Bayesian statistics. And uh, in Bayesian statistics, quite often, you want to compute the posterior. You know, consider this very simple graphical model, for example, that you have a random variable z, and then it goes to random variable x, right? And it's, it's a latent model, for example. You know, you, you, haven't, you don't observe z, but you do observe x. But you believe that x is governed by a hidden variable z. Uh, so quite often, you want to compute pz given x, the posterior. Right? Given the observation, what, what's the code that generate this observation? That's the case of regression. That's the case of classification. That's the case of uh, topic modeling. You know, you have a text and you want to do which topic actually this comes from. So PZ given X is PX given Z times PZ divided by PX, right? Px given z is usually quite easy to compute, you know, because that's your model. Given z, how can I generate x? That's usually explicitly given. And pz is your prior, but this is quite hard to compute, you know, because this is, in fact, px given z times pz over all z's, right? And if Z is high dimensional, this is going to be intractable. Because if it's high dimensional, it's a complicated integral in this form, you know. Um, 
that's the main obstacle in graphical models, or one of the main obstacles in graphical model that usually computing this is intractable. And it, it, the huge literature of graphical model or Bayesian statistics is about approximating this uh, intractable quantity. And there are many different techniques. One line of techniques is sampling techniques. You do Gibbs sampling by, by Monte Carlo. You do Monte Carlo, you do, uh, and there are many techniques. You do Gibbs sampling, you do Metropolis, Metropolis Hastings, hybrid sampling, and, di and different techniques of sampling, right? MC, all MCMC techniques. These are one area of basically research on one, one set of techniques to get around this. Another set of techniques is variational inference. And variational inference, in fact, in, 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 in principle, means that like, let's turn this uh, intractable um, quantity to an optimization problem. I can't solve for p z given x. You know, I cannot find it. Variational inference turn it to an optimization problem by assuming that there exists another type of or another uh, um, distribution which is tractable. Find the parameters of that one such that that one is quite close to this one. And if it's close to this one, you know, I, I just use that as a surrogate, not this one directly. You know, the one which is close to this one. So basically, we assume that there is a Q, and this Q comes from a well-behaved family. You know, it's Gaussian, for example. And it's parameterized by theta. And then I want to minimize the KL divergence of this Q, you know, I just drop this theta with my posterior. If I can minimize this, uh, if I can minimize this KL divergence and find appropriate thetas, then this is close to my posterior and this is well behaved, it's from Gaussian, I'm gonna use this instead of this. So I get around the problem. So I didn't write PZ given X because this theta depends on X. I can, I can write it Z given X, but it's not common because this theta is a function of X, you know. It is in fact a distribution of Z given X, but not directly, not explicitly, implicitly through theta. Okay, so uh, to derive, basically to see how we can minimize this, because it's not trivial how to minimize the scale divergence, you know, because the scale divergence depends on a quantity which is unknown to me. It depends on PZ given X, and my problem was that I don't know PZ given X, you know. How can I minimize the scale divergence? So we can, I mean, variational inference is a way to get around this. And I, I'm going to explain how. Um, but before I explain how, you know, the, the KL divergence itself, which is a measure of the similarity between, or similarity between two distributions, comes from um, information theory. You know, in information theory, you can compute the information of uh, event x as negative log of px. Higher probability, lower information, and vice versa. You know, if I tell you something which is very likely, tomorrow is rainy or is not rainy, the probability is 1. I didn't convey any information, right? The information is zero. If I tell you tomorrow it's going to be negative 20, very unlikely. There's lots of information, you know. You can make a news out of this sentence, you know. If I'm a credible person and it's 
claim that tomorrow is going to be negative 20, it's going to be headline of news that something very unlikely is going to happen. You know, some people are in the news all the time because they are unpredictable. Donald Trump, you know, in the news every day because you can't predict him. But if you're a well-behaved president, you know, you're not in the news because you, you, they can't predict you. So uh, information is negative log of PX. Okay, and there's another quantity which is uh, entropy. And entropy is basically the expectation of this information. So it's a negative sum of uh, PX log. Uh, Px. That's entropy, right? Now, suppose uh, I mean, what is KL divergence? Then KL divergence of uh, Q with respect to P. Um, I'm going to write it as entropy of this is going to be entropy of P. Minus entropy of Q. Not quite, actually, it's not quite right, you know. But because in KL divergence, you compute the expectation always with respect to certain probability. And this is expectation with respect to P, this is expectation with respect to Q. If both of them are with respect to a single probability, so this expectation is also with respect to Q, then this is KL divergence. So basically, KL divergence tell you the information loss if you want to transfer from one distribution to another one. And that's why this is a measure of the similarity between these two. So this is going to be, uh, if I simplify this, it's going to be negative sigma qx log uh, px divided by qx. That's the definition of KL divergence, you know. And uh, And you can see that if there are two distributions, like distribution P, for example, and distribution Q, and suppose that these are discrete distributions, and they're identical, you know, this is 0 0.5, and this is 0 0.5. So if I compute KL divergence, I have the term log Px divided by Qx. P is 0 0.5, Q is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 is 1, log of 1 is 0, and then I take the summation, it's 0. So KL divergence between P and Q is 0, right? Means these two are the same distributions. But if this is different, say this is 0 0.25 and this is 0 0.75, for example, then when you compute this, the 0. 0 0.75 divided by 0 0.5, then you take the log and then the take summation. It's going to be a positive number eventually. So it means these two distributions are different. So this can be used as a measure of the similarity between two distributions. And KL divergence is always positive. It's greater than or equal to 0. And KL divergence of uh, P, Q, is not the same as KL divergence of Q and P. Write it here. KL divergence of PQ is different from KL divergence of uh, uh, QP. So it's not symmetric. It's not the distance. It's divergence. Um, that's two important things to know. Okay, let's come back, get back to our problem. <clears throat> and I'm in this scenario that I have a simple graphical model, and I want to compute, I want to minimize KL divergence of Q and P. <clears throat>
when P is intractable. And okay, I can't do it directly because this is a, a quantity that's unknown to me, right? So, but I can write the definition. So I need KL divergence of Q. I drop theta, you know, for simplicity. Uh, with this posterior. Okay, this is going to be what? This is going to be summation or in, if this is um, basically, you know, continuous, it's gonna be integral of Q Z log of P Z given X divided by Q Z. Right? That's the definition of uh, KL divergence. Okay, so PZ given X is what? You know, PZ given X is PX given Z times PZ, which is PZ and X, divided by PX, right? Okay. So if I replace this here, in a step PZ given X, if I replace PZ and X divided by PX, this is going to be negative QZ log PZ and X, so the joint distribution of Z and X, divided by PX times QZ, right? Is that okay so far? So I can rewrite it as negative QZ log P um, Z and X divided by <coughs> QZ times one over PX. I'll just write it this way. Okay, this is going to be negative. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be negative QZ log PZX divided by QZ plus log of one over PX or minus log of uh, Px, right? So this is an interesting term here because this is basically negative Qz log <coughs> Pzx divided by Qz uh, plus QZ log PX. And don't forget that this is with respect to Q. You know, when we compute this expectation, this integral, it's with respect to Q. It's QZ log PX. Log PX has nothing to do with this in summation, right? So you can take it out. So you know, I can write this as log Px, integral of Qz. There's a dz which I dropped. What's the integral of Qz, dz, or Q? Sorry? It's one, you know, because it's a probability distribution. So this term is just like Px. Uh, and log Px has nothing to do with Z, has nothing to do with theta. It's just a constant, you know, it's my observation. <clears throat> okay, so this term is just log Px. So what do I have here? I have, so far, I have, uh, 
I wanted to minimize KL divergence of this. And it turned out that it's equal to QZ log PZX over QZ plus log of PX, which is constant. Okay, if I want to minimize this left-hand side, it's the same as minimizing the right-hand side, right? And minimizing the right-hand side means maximizing this quantity because this is constant, okay? Maximizing this quantity because it has a negative sign. This quantity is called uh, elbow, evidence lower bound, or variational lower bound. So in variational inference, you start with uh, minimizing a KL divergence to make a, a tractable distribution similar to intractable distribution. And uh, the whole idea is to compute this elbow. And instead of minimizing the KL divergence, maximize this. This is tractable. You know, maximizing this is tractable. It does not depend on this unknown Z over X. It's joint distribution, which is tractable, and QZ is the well-behaved distribution that we chosen, you know can choose this to be Gaussian. And we expand this more to see how it's tractable, but uh, I just want to tell you what the idea is. Okay, that's the idea. And wh why, why do we call it lower bound? Because if you look at this, uh, <coughs> you know, if I rearrange the terms here, I have log Px, which is a constant. This cost constant is KL divergence of Qz and uh, Pz given x plus this lower bound, right? Plus which is QZ log PZX divided by QZ, right? Okay, uh, let's call this lower bound. You know, you have a constant and this constant, you know, you have a constant and this constant is KL divergence plus L. And I want to minimize KL. If I minimize KL, this L is going to be larger, right? And KL is always positive. It's greater than or equal to zero. So L will never be the same as PX unless KL is zero. So L is lower bound of this log probability. It's the likelihood of your data. Okay? So it's lower bound. And intuitively, you know, you computed the lower bound of your likelihood, and you maximize the lower bound. When you maximize the lower bound, you push the likelihood up, right? Because it's lower bound. It can't eat always less. You push it up, this goes up. Right? And that's why it's called lower bound. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, get back to this part and see what this part means. This part which we, we said is tractable. So I have, I mean my lower bound is QZ log PZX 
divided by QZ. So I can write it as uh, you know I can write it as P Z given X times P X divide by what? Divide by P uh, or sorry no not divide by nothing. So P Z X is P, just P Z given X times P X, right? And I have Q Z here. Okay. So I write it as Q Z <coughs> log P Z given X, this term, plus <coughs> Q Z log. Px over Qz. This is, sorry, uh, let me write it as Px given z times Pz instead of Pz given x. So this is going to be Pz and this is going to be Px given z. Okay? Okay, what is this term? Let's look at the definition of KL divergence. Based on the definition of KL divergence is what? KL divergence of Q and P, right? With negative sign. So the second term is basically negative KL divergence of QZ and P. And the first term is expectation of um, log PX given Z. That's expectation of log, basic. that's log likelihood of my observation, right? So this is my lower bound, which I have to maximize. I have to maximize because I have to minimize this scale divergence. This scale divergence, uh, in contrast with the scale divergence that we had at the beginning, which was intractable, is tractable, you know, because Q, Q is from a well-behaved distribution that we have chosen. And uh, so we just make P similar to Q marginal of P, not this is sorry Z again. And this is the likelihood of our data. So we maximize the likelihood of our data. <coughs> okay, <coughs> let's now put all of these things together and see how it turns or can be turned to uh, you know an autoencoder. So the idea here is that in this graphical model, you know, I generate x given z. So p x given z. And I generate z given x, or I hope to be able to compute this posterior, which compute z given x. And we decided that we approximate this by some q parameterized by Tate. In this autoencoder, I feed the model with x and I get Z, right? So this is basically P Z given X. Given X, I want Z. So I, I replace this function, which is a neural network, for P Z given X. And P Z given X, I approximated with some theta, uh, with some Q, sorry. 
and this one is just p uh, x given z. It generate x given this hidden variable z, right? So the idea here is that I approximate these uh, two part of my model, the encoder and decoder. I approximate the encoder with this Q, and I approximate my decoder with P. Okay, they, they gonna, these neural networks are going to be functions that uh, basically approximate these two probabilities. Now, if I want to train this model, I have to maximize this lower bound uh, and the maximization of this lower bound has two parts. That's one part. Q comes from a well-behaved distribution. It's my choice. I've chosen Q to be Gaussian, for example. I have to minimize the KL divergence between Gaussian and Q. Okay? Z basically should be Gaussian, you know. The Z should be Gaussian. That's one part of this objective function. The other part of the objective function told me that the maximize the likelihood. Maximize the likelihood, you can directly maximize the likelihood or you can make some sort of assumption. If your assumption is that this, this is Gaussian, then maximizing likelihood is the same as minimizing uh, mean square error, right? If you assume this is Bernoulli, it's going to be the same as minimizing, uh, like, uh, what's that? The other objective function, um, cross entropy, right? Um, so my objective function here would be this one with the assumption that it's Gaussian. I have to minimize the reconstruction and, uh, and I have to make sure that this is Gaussian. Q is Gaussian. So in, in deterministic where uh, at the encoder, I had this one, you know. Just, I, I have a model, get, takes x, I want to this produce x at the output. I just have one more constraint to the problem, one additional term added to my objective function. And this additional term makes sure that this z is Gaussian, you know. So reconstruct <clears throat> the point and make sure that this z is Gaussian. That's going to be variational autoencoder. Okay, by adding this additional term. Any question? Okay, there's one, uh, still there's one problem in practice here. And the problem is that if this z is a stochastic, you can't do back propagation, you know, you can pass gradient through a stochastic layer, you know, because it's, it's not determinist, it can't take derivative, right? So to handle this, uh, in the original variational autoencoder paper, they do something which is called um, reparameterization trick. And the trick is that make this somehow entangle uh, stochasticity of the problem and parameters. You know, this is Gaussian, and Gaussian is a stochastic, but Gaussian comes from a distribution. Distribution has a mean and a covariance, or a variance, right? And mean and variance are parameters, which could be deterministic. You know, this is the mean of my Gaussian. This is the variance of my Gaussian, fixed. Right? Or I can learn it. It's parameters of the model. But through these Gaussian, now I can sample <coughs> something random. So Z, instead of being just the representation of the Z, 
could be parameters of the z in my model. So basically I have x <coughs> and originally you said that this z is going to be a representation of this x in hidden space or in low dimensional space and has distribution of Gaussian. But in the training, I'm going to have problem with backpropagation. So instead, I'm going to ha say that it's going to be a vector such that this part is mu and this part is sigma, for example. And so x will be mapped to this mu and sigma. But I need z to be passed to my uh, decoder, you know? I'm going to generate Z. How can I go, how I'm going to generate Z? I'm going to define a new uh, <coughs> variable, epsilon. And epsilon is just a standard, standard Gaussian. So I take this standard Gaussian. I take this standard Gaussian and multiply this standard Gaussian by sigma added by mu, and that's going to be my z. So when I want to pass something to my uh, decoder, I pass z. But z is mu plus sigma epsilon, and epsilon is just a standard normal. I don't need to learn this is standard normal, right? I separated the parameters, you know, the, the, the whole process is stochastic, but I separated uh, stochasticity from the parameters. These are parameters that I can learn by backpropagation. The, the parameters are learned by backpropagation. I sample from a standard Gaussian, make my z, pass it to my decoder. You know, that's the idea of reparameterization. Yes? Uh, usually it's a vector, and usually this is uh, basically pairwise. So as if your covariance is um, um, what's that? The, the, the diagonal. Okay. So it's not a full covariance matrix. So you just learn this part. It's a vector, it's not a number. Any question? This is a variational autoencoder that's trained on uh, C4, okay? So it's, and you know, we take the decoder part, as I said, you just sample from a Gaussian, pass it through, and it generate, you know, a scene, an animal, you know, an image similar to C4, you know, pretty impressive. But um, if you compare it with some, you know, we have a class of generative models and uh, variational autoencoder is not the only one. We have GAN that we're gonna see later, right? And if you compare with GAN, for example, GAN produces better uh, images compared to variational autoencoder. 
And more recently, we have diffusion models which performs better than both of these two, GAN and variational autoencoder. But uh, one question actually is that why images produced by a variational autoencoder usually are somehow um, as is, as somehow faded, you know, it's it's blurry, you know, compared to GAN. Uh, the, the main reason is that in variational autoencoder, we maximize the likelihood, you know, eventually we maximize the likelihood. And likelihood is not a measure of uh, sharpness of the image eventually, right? Because you can have an image which is not sharp and has high likelihood because if you, if you think of the concept of the likelihood and you want to maximize this expectation, which is a summation, you know, still you can manage to maximize it without making, making this sharp, you know, without making this sharp. So that's one of the drawbacks of variational autoencoder as a generative model. But it's pretty interesting technique in general, and it's a merge of, uh, in fact, deep learning and graphical models. Given a graphical models, you can go through this process of finding the lower bound and come up with an objective function which maximizes the likelihood of this graphical model given some data when all of these connections in your graphical model are defined by some neural networks, you know. It, it doesn't need to be as simple as this one and variational autoencoder, you know. It opens a door to a more general area of uh, modeling a graphical model by a neural network, but the process would be exactly the same, you know. Start with, uh, variational inference and finding a KL, minimizing KL divergence, go through it, compute the lower bound, and that would be the objective function that you have to maximize, and each piece of your graphical model would be a neural network now. Okay, any question? Okay, see you on Thursday.